morning and welcome to MSOG Revival. I'm Jerome Jones. I'm going to be your teacher for the next hour. And I want to first of all greet all of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is good and he is so worthy to be praised. We honor him today and certainly this is the day that the Lord has made. And we are rejoicing and we are glad in this day. I'm going to be sharing with you from God's Word today, and the subject is living a sinless life. Now, I want you to get your Bibles, and let's take a trip into the Word of God. Uh, I oftentimes love to encourage all that are hearing the Word and that are a part of any service to have the Word of God in front of you. So as much as you can, get your Bibles and uh, follow along with us. And that may be your smartphone, that may be your iPad, your computer, wherever you have the scriptures. Uh, so we want to also uh, say that we're going to be taking excerpts of today's lesson, and we're going to we're going to take them from the study guide. Uh, the church is Christ on earth, and uh, this is the study guide that God used Apostle Mary Banks to write, and uh, we're going to, and perhaps Apostle Kareem Flowers assisting, and, and we're going to um, go into this study and take some excerpts from this particular book. Now, if you don't have this book, again, I want to encourage you to get it. You know, every minister uh, should have this, and as well as every child of God. It is a tremendous uh, truth that is explained uh, in so many simplistic forms. So I want to encourage you to get that. Now, I'm going to take some excerpts from a lesson that Apostle Banks taught just recently. And that lesson, you probably see it online as well, on sinlessness. And so the, today's lesson is going to follow up with that on living a sinless life. That's what we're uh, talking about today. That's the subject of today. And so I'm going to kind of go back and then come forward. And then as we uh, get to that point where she left off, we're going to uh, see if the Lord will allow us to go a little bit further and to share a little more uh, on that subject. So now, one of the first things that one has to grapple with, uh, one has to accept, is can one live a sinless life? Is that possible? That, that, you know, um, if you're going to uh, study the word or you're going to seek to examine what, this, what God wants and what God's expectations are, We've got to answer that question even in our mind before we get into the study. We have to come with that disposition. Either it is possible or it is not possible. And we have to determine what side uh, of that equation that you and I are on. If I'm going to engage in this study, I must have a position already whether or not I believe it is possible or I don't believe that's possible. And that's where all of mankind is. No matter where you are in the world, you either believe that it is possible or you don't believe it is possible to live a sinless life. This is the dust up. This is what is causing many to be frustrated or many to be uh, kind of like, you know, confused as to 
what it is. So today I want to really examine that question. I really want to uh, uh, do what uh, God will allow us to do here in answering that because I believe that in the lesson that we've already heard, I believe that we've heard it not only when Apostle Banks ministered right here, but we've heard it down through the years. I can go back in time and remember when the book was written, Be Ye Perfect. You know, and that was a, a word that was brought forth to the body of Christ because it was already in the scripture. It wasn't new. It wasn't something that was just new. The scripture said, be ye perfect long before there was a, a, a me or was an a, a apostle Banks or was any of us. The scripture had already declared for us to be perfect. And it didn't just declare for us to be perfect. Because sometimes when we deal with the term, be ye perfect, according to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. Sometimes when we deal with that term, we tend to, we tend to make another definition for perfect. We tend to uh, ascribe a definition to perfect that undercuts what the true meaning and the true expectations of God is. Now, I understand a little bit, a little bit about perfect. There's three different teleu, teleutis, and teleo. Those are different uh, terminologies, different words, different phases. But it doesn't matter whether it was the, it doesn't matter in respect to what God was telling us in that scripture. See, because God is the one that went on to explain that. And let's just look at it just for the sake of, let's look at Matthew chapter 5. And let's look at the 48th verse of that uh, passage. It says, be ye therefore perfect. Now, this is where most of us just kind of lay it down at. You know, we kind of lay it down there and we say, that, you know, the, the scripture says be ye perfect. But it's, it's, it really goes on a little bit more than that. Because it doesn't allow now, this, see, the scripture does not allow for me to define perfection. The scripture doesn't allow for no minister to define what perfection is. I know we go into our deep theories and, and academics, but the scripture and God is too wise to leave the definition of what he says to man. I want you to understand. Now, that's a good principle. The Holy Spirit just now ministered that in my spirit and said, that's the principle that we have to employ when we are even studying the word of God. What principle? That the, whole, that the, that the God of heaven does not leave it to any individual to define what he is saying. Now, when I understand that and when I accept that, then I won't get off into left field trying to redefine what the scripture say. You know, I've learned something over the years, and I, I, I'll tell this to, to Jesus come. I'll tell this on the mountaintop, and I'll tell it if I'm being covered in sand. I am not qualified to define what God means in scripture. And I've been doing this for 50 plus years, and it doesn't give me not one star to define what he means in Scripture. So Jesus and the, the, the God of heaven says, I'm not going to just say be perfect. I'm not just going to leave it now for you to try to define determine to determine or to define what that means. So what do you say? He said, be ye therefore perfect. This is what he's telling us. And then he goes on and defines it himself. Even as your 
Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. So what Jesus is teaching his disciples and those that are around, I am commanding that you be perfect and the way that I'm talking about, the way that I'm uh, instructing you and the expectations that I have and my definition of being perfect is to the same degree is your father in heaven. Now, I, I, I see, I, I've said this when I was in Jamaica and we was in this conference, in the Caribbean conference, that this, this study guide here that has been so gracefully written is the total embodiment of all that is relevant to, to the Christian life. See, because here we have oneness here. Jesus said, I want you to be just like. I want you to be the same. See? I want you to be the same as your father when it comes to perfection. See? So, so he doesn't leave it just there for us to, 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 to uh, figure it out or uh, to do define it ourselves. So I want to take us back. Uh, Apostle Banks took us somewhere, so I'm going to go back there. I want to go back there to Genesis chapter um, 2. Genesis chapter 2, and I'm going to start at the 15th verse of that chapter and go to verse 17. So just take these scriptures down because I'm going to be giving you a lot of scriptures all the way through the lesson. And I'm going to do all that God would give me to do today. I'm, not, I'm throwing caution to the wind. I'm not going to worry about anything else. Just going to do what God has set me here to do today. Now, Dr. Banks taught this lesson on sinlessness. And she took us back to uh, Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to start at the 15th verse. And it says these words here. Um, in, in Genesis chapter 2, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. I, 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 I don't often make reference to this part, but isn't it interesting that Adam got where he was, not on his own, but because God put him there. See, God put Adam in the garden. When, when Adam woke up, he was where God wanted him. See, when you and I woke up in the new creation, we were also where God wanted us. Adam woke up in a perfect garden. We woke up in a perfect garden in a perfect environment. We woke up in this new creation, perfect, whole, without sin. Huh? Adam got up in the garden, whole, perfect, and without sin. Huh? You, you follow me now, because I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just kind of walk on through this because. I hear the voice of the chief shepherd. And I'm just going to walk on through this. Now, here is Adam being placed in the garden. And verse 16 says, and the Lord God commanded the man. See, God does not just put us somewhere with no instructions. God doesn't just leave us to find our own way. He's too wise for that. So he commanded the man saying, of every tree that thou, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. In other words, he said, Adam, every tree of the garden is for you to freely eat from. But, now, see, see, because when we said every tree, if the, if, the, if the thought 
ended there, then there would be no restrictions. But let me assure you something here. Your freedom comes with restrictions. Mm -hmm. Your freedom is conditioned upon a response from you. We're not going to enjoy the liberty of the spirit unless we do something. Huh? So what does he say? Every tree but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou sh shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. So now we see, now we see that this God have given, have, have created Adam, have put him in the garden, and have given him instructions and have made it clear to Adam that Adam knew what God expected. Why am I here? Because I want you to see something here. Adam had no one to instruct him. There wasn't another Jerome Jones to instruct Adam. There was another Apostle Banks. There wasn't another uh, Billy Graham. There wasn't another Elijah. There wasn't a, a, another Peter or Paul or John. Or there wasn't. But God made sure that Adam thoroughly understood what he instructed him of. Now, now, is God any different today? Is he, is he any different today? It, it, is, is God able today hmm, to make you and I thoroughly sure of what his intent, what his instructions for us today? If Adam could be uh, in a deep sleep, if Adam could be uh, laying there on, before God and gets waken up by God and instantly know how to carry out his assignment all over the garden. See, he knew how to name all the creatures. He knew how to go about dressing the garden. He knew the tree that God told him not to eat from. He knew all of those things without having anybody there to tell him, okay, now this is what you need not to do. This is what you uh, have been assigned to do. No, God told him and made sure that he knew it. And so when we that are born again, that have the Holy Ghost in us, it is a travesty for us to even hint at the fact that we don't know what God expects of us with that same God living on the inside. Well, bless the Lord. Now, let's go a little bit further. I want us to see something here. I want us to see, as Apostle Banks dealt with, something here that was so important when God put Adam there God expected Adam to get up every day and choose to obey him that's what God expected of Adam he expected Adam to get up every day every day and walk holy before him that's he, that was his, his expectation. And that was the reason for giving Adam this commandment. Okay, Adam, you can have all the trees in the garden. Good for you. Eat freely from them. Except 
this one tree here. I don't want you to eat. I don't want you to touch it. I don't want you to do anything with it lest you die. So it was that one thing that God said, I'm going to restrict you from. Why? See, because if there was nothing that gave Adam the right of choice, then Adam would have simply been a robot and could not have provided God with what God wanted. Robots can't love God. So God was seeking a family, seeking uh, that affection and that love to be given back to him freely, not forcefully, but freely. So he says, I, I, I just going to give you everything. I'm going to give you a perfect world. I'm going to give you the ability to live holy and godly and righteous all the days of your life so that you can live forever. But, it's, but if you violate my commandment, all of that is over. See? And so... Adam had to choose to live without sin. It was a choice. So as, as Doc kept on taking us, God not only expected that, but God put the tree right in the midst of the garden. God says, I'm not going to hide the tree in some corner. I'm not going to hide it. I'm, I'm going to put it right there so you can see it. Because, see, if you can't see the other side, if you can't see the other options, then you no longer have an option. So God allowed this tree to be right there in the middle of the garden. So Adam sees it every day. Because every day, God wanted Adam to love him enough to never touch that tree. That's what God wanted. That's what he expected. And as long as Adam obeyed that instructions, he lived free from sin in the garden. And there was harmony in all of his environment. Harmony. None of the animals rose up against Adam. None of the animals rose up against Eve. The animals wasn't fighting and killing each other. Everything in the garden was in harmony. As long as Adam obeyed God's command. Now let's transmit that over in our lives. You want the peace of God. You want the power of God. You want the supernatural anointing. You want signs and wonders. You want to be an expression of the God and the Godhead that you are a part of. My God. And God says, okay. <laughs> you know, that's what God, God says, okay. I want that too. And so God says, I have a role in that, and you have a role in that. And as long as you walk in obedience to my commandment, you will be able to express the power of the Godhead. You will be able to exemplify the character of the Godhead. You will be able to take your rightful place in the joint heirship of Jesus Christ as long as as you obey my instruction. But the moment you disobey my instruction, you lose the authority to exercise the power of the Godhead. You lose the authority to exemplify my character. You lose all of that. See, Satan came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He knows what he's after. He knows what he's after. He's very crafty, very cunning. He's very substitute. And so, so I, 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 just, I just see this here. 
my Lord, my Lord, let, let me go a little bit further here. Um, so as we was in the lesson, God wants me to choose. He says, Jerome, will you choose to obey me every day? God wants it to be my choice, not forced because I heard Apostle Banks preaching. And I want to satisfy her or her another pastor, another evangelist, another son of God. No, 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 no. All of that is good because I, I have to hear. We, we, are, we, are, we are created to hear the truth and to grow by. But God wants it to be my personal choice to obey him. Not obeying him like a little child that sits down because he's scared of mom and dad. That's not the kind of love God is looking for. And that's the kind of love many sons of God is trying to give to God. And it is worthless. God don't want me to be fearful of him in that way. That's why the scripture says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he gave us a spirit of love, the spirit of power, and the spirit of a sound mind. That's what God gave me. So he wants me to take that love and love him back. Take that love and inside of a sound mind, choose every day to be just like my father. That's what he's want. Now that gives him joy. That makes him glad. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Now, so, so we go a little bit further here, and it says, and let me just, ooh, I got to run. It says, and see, I, t I take notes when I am in study a lot of times, and so, you know, I don't trust my memory all the time. I get into this word. It says uh, in my notes, God expected him not to touch that tree, and if he, as long as he obeyed, he would live forever. That's what God, that was God's expectations of him. Even without the Holy Ghost in him, he was able to obey. Now, do you see that? Sometimes that could be missed, you know. Sometimes I could just miss that. But even without the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost was not in Adam. I'm not going to get into 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Doc took us because I would, I would end up staying there all day. But even without the Holy Ghost, here is a man that is fully able to obey God and to live forever. Let me say this about that. It doesn't matter what dispensation one was born in. What biblical dispensation a person was born in, they always, they always had the ability to obey God. You know, they, people say, well, I, I couldn't, well, I can go back to see where Job obeyed God. He was born in a time when there was a lot of sin. Lot obeyed God. He was born in a time when there was sin running rapid all over the place. Okay, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they obeyed God. Daniel obeyed God. Samuel obeyed God. You know, I mean, God, if, you know, obedience to God had to be present with all in order for them to be judged for disobeying God. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Now, now let's go a little bit further here. You have to make a decision every day to obey God. This is very, this is a principle that is important because sometimes we live off of our past experiences. But every day we have to make a decision to obey God, okay? God put the tree in full view of Adam and Eve. He didn't, he didn't hide it. He didn't say, well, I'm going to stick it over in a corner, cover it up with another bigger tree, 
And if they happen to get to it, they'll have to stumble up on it. No, God put that tree right there before. There's something that, there's, that sometimes that is running through your mind that is, is, is an temptation. It's an it's a, a act of this or an attitude of that. And, and it's front and center. And God is, 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 is right there. And, and it's up to you to decide. Are you going to take that temptation and and live it out, or are you going to resist that temptation and choose to obey God? You and I have those encounters and those experiences every day, but God still expects me and you to get up every day and choose to live a sinless life. He expects me to get up and live, uh, choose to live a sinless life. And, and you're so, so he says in his word, he is, there's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. For God would not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able to bear. But with the temptation also, huh? We'll make a way, I'll provide a way for you to escape that you may be able to bear. In other words, God is saying, I'm not going to let the temptation overtake you. It's not going to overcome your will. You have to surrender your will. And if you surrender your will, then you bring yourself under the captivity of such. And Adam surrendered his will. Oh, my God. I just, you know, sometimes I wonder, why do I get into these kind of studies? These are the kind of studies that just kind of, just kind of caused me to just, I, I, I always have five lessons in one. Always. Just, 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 uh, this is so, so powerful here. See? Because Satan wants to control your willpower. Mm hmm. So with his willpower, Adam could obey God, and Satan knew it. So he said, if I can get control of his willpower, then he will do everything I will him to do. See, that's why I don't put no stock in this when people say, now I will never do that. You've heard people say that? I mean, bishops say that. Apostles say that. Pastors say that. Evangelists, teachers been saved 30 and 40 years and you know you hear them say I will never do it. and you know what that lends itself to that lends itself to you to look down on people that do that or have done that in the past when you take the position that I will never do something like you don't know what you will ever do see you don't know what you'll do but you should know you know why you should know because the scripture says, don't leave it for me. The scripture says, to whom huh, ye yield your members to, his servant ye are. So when you yield your will, huh, I'm sure Adam didn't wake up thinking that's what he was going to do. I'm sure that it, it wasn't in his plan, see? But when you yield your will to Satan, you will do anything that Satan beckon you to do. I know you got, got some people that, that may think that, oh, no, I wouldn't. There's just some things I'm not going to do. You don't know what you're talking about because Satan is the strong man when you yield yourself to him. He is the strong man. You are just a prisoner. And a prisoner does what the master of the prison tells them to do. Not what they want to do. They do what they tell them to do. So this is why salvation was so glorious. This is why it was so powerful. Because we were shut up in a prison. Walking in sin. Doing the lust of the devil. But salvation broke the chains of bondage and let us walk out of a captivity and walk into the liberty of Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. And now we can say to that same prison master, 
You have no power. Oh, glory to God. Over me. But the whole matters have been reversed. You had power over me. But now I have power over you. Oh, bless you, Father. You, you had authority over me. You control what I thought. You control what I was thinking. But now I got power over you because the word of God said, Behold, I give unto you power, power over all the power of the enemy, power to tread upon serpents and scorpions, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I have obtained this power over you. Oh, bless you, Jesus. And just like you dominated my life, just like you forced me to do all the evil bidding of your own lust, I'm going to force you to watch me obey the Father. I'm going to force you to watch me worship God. I'm going to force you to watch the operation of God through this natural body that you once had authority over. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Living a sinless life. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Now, let's look a little bit further here. Let's, let's see, if, see if something else is going to be uh, jumping out of this at us. Because I wrote something when this was being taught. And Doc alluded to it. And that's, that, that led me to write something about it. Because I've often said this. Adam wasn't the first rebellion. There was a rebellion in the heavens. Lucifer rebelled against God. And even in all of God's creation of those angels, he still gave them. He gave them, them a choice. And Lucifer had to choose whether or not he was going to stay in the habitation where God placed him or whether or not he was going to uh, uh, exercise his will, see, to exalt himself or to do contrary to what God said. And that's what we have today. We have the will. We still have the power to choose whether or not we're going to obey God and stay in the habitation where God placed us as sons of God, or whether or not we are going to violate the commandment of God and do the bidding now of God's enemy. See, we have that opportunity. We have that ability to decide. Now, I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how long you've been in God. I don't care how much knowledge you know. Don't care how many revelations you've unraveled. You still have to decide to obey God every day if you're going to live a sinless life. It is impossible to live a sinless life without obeying God. There's no perfect life without obedience to God. So if I'm going to live a sinless life, I will only be able to do it as long as I keep God's commandments. As long as I operate in the word and spirit of God, I will never commit sin. But when I decide to yield myself to the temptation of the world or Satan or anything other than God, then I then become a slave and violate the holy commandments of God. The only life of perfection is in the Holy Spirit. The only perfect life is in the Holy Spirit. That's why the scriptures tell us that we are to be led by the Spirit 
And as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. It also tells us that those that are in the flesh cannot please God. See? So therefore, the only perfect life is living according and by the Spirit and Word of God. I was listening at, 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 at something that's something that's important too. There's something that is important because people think that you're talking about being all spooky when you're talking about spirit. No. See, I, uh, I believe it was uh, one of the messages that Apostle Mike ministered was it, that he hinted and, and alluded to this scripture that the word is spirit. See? And well, the scripture tells us that the word is spirit. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are life and they are spirit. He said, the flesh profited nothing, but the spirit giveth life. And the words that I speak to you, they are spirit. Oh, bless you, Jesus. So, therefore, now, we, we, when we say we are walking in the spirit, we are walking in obedience to the word of God. And there is nowhere on the in, in 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 the entire existence of the world that you and I can look at a man or woman of God that walked in obedience to God and that led them into sin nowhere we don't have an example of that see so if I'm going to be perfect as my father, that means I've got to be sinless as my father is sinless, see? And so now, let's, let's see here, because I, I, I want us to address something. Now, we know what happened to Lucifer. Lucifer fell and uh, left his habitation, and, and he, 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 he went into sin, and that cost him uh, to where he is today. But I want us to see something uh, here before before I go any further I thought in one of the lessons that there was a there was the insertion of a scripture and I'm going to try to find that right now I, I hear it in my mind and I'm going to try to find it that doesn't mean that doesn't mean I'm going to find it guys and I just uh, but I'm going to try there was an insertion of a scripture that I just think just really unraveled all of the intent of God, all of the purpose of God. It just kind of like grabbed that and just un and peeled back all of the things off of it and answered all the questions. You know what that scripture was? It's found in the book of Luke. That 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 and I've 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 went there and studied it before, but I want to I, I want to see if I can find it. Now, it's in Luke chapter 1, so if you follow along with me, let's go there and see what it says. And um, I think now, we're going to look at verse 70, and I think we're going to look at verse 73. Yes, let's, let's go to 73 and start there. The oath which he swore unto our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. You see that? Now that's a principle there too that we need to examine. I can't make you afraid enough that and that be the thing that caused you to come to God. Mm -mm. All right, God is not looking for me to serve him out of fear. He's, he's not doing that. He wants me, Hebakosi, he wants me to of my own free will after having experienced his love for me. He wants me, because I've been impacted by his love, to freely yield and bestow my love unto him. That's what he wants. He doesn't want me to be forced to serve him. 
He doesn't want me to be so scared like he's the big bad boogeyman. He doesn't want that. Even though he is a terror. Even though it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. I just want you to know, we know what the scriptures teach us. And it is a dangerous thing. It is a treacherous thing to fall into the hands of a living, of an angry God. But God doesn't want us to serve him out of that fear. He wants to serve him out of a genuine love. So what he says, that we, might serve, that we might serve him without fear. How? In holiness and righteousness before him. In other words, he says, I want you to be going be to and fro before me in holiness and in righteousness. Now, my God, I didn't have this in my notes, didn't put this in my notes, but the Holy Spirit is injecting something here, so we're going to make a slight turn. Look what he says. Not only do I want you to do that, see, I'm talking about living a sinless life. Look at God's expectations here. Is to live this way. All the days of our life. Are you getting that? Not half of your life. Three quarters of your life. But all the days of our life. In other words, God says, I expect you to get up every day and live holy. I expect you to get up every day and live in righteousness. I expect you to choose every day. I want you to make a decision to choose me. Saying, God, I'm going to live unto you today. I'm going to walk by your law today. I'm going to obey you today. I'm going to bring glory to you today. I'm going to exalt your name today. I'm going to worship you today. I don't have anything to give to the devil. That's why Paul said we are not debtors to the flesh any longer. We don't owe it nothing. Somebody ought to praise his name. Oh, but this God. Says, I want you to do it. Now let's go to a scripture in, in Titus. In Titus, the second chapter. Let's go there. Because Titus 2 and verse 11 starts to the 13th. Said, for the grace of of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. My God. Now remember Luke says that we're to live holy and righteous all the days of our life serving God without fear. I'm so glad I can walk to and fro in the earth knowing the peace of God in. Knowing that I have a father Bless God that I can worship and praise and exalt. But I can only do it through obeying his word. I have to choose to obey God. I have to choose to worship him. I have to choose to be righteous. Choose to walk in holiness. I've been made holy doesn't mean I'm walking in holiness. I've been made righteous doesn't mean I'm walking in righteousness. You and I have to choose every day. That's why Jesus said you must pick up your cross daily and follow me. It ain't a one time deal. It's a daily deal. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Now, let's look a little bit further. Let's look what he says here in Titus 2 says, salvation, the grace that brings salvation have appeared to all men. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness. See, that's what grace does. Folks that, folks that go around and they're talking about grace is a cover for sin. Folks that walk around and teach and preach that grace, they just don't understand the word of God. They just don't understand. 
I know there's a lot of folks that are going to say, well, they, they know better than that. No, they just don't understand. If, they, if they're born again, now, if they're not born again, they just, you know, they're doing Satan's bidding by, by, by the will of Satan, and, and all of that is to discredit God. But there are, many, there are many people that are born again that don't understand now the word of God. So, so this says, but grace does something. See, the grace of God does something. What does it do? It teaches us to deny ungodliness. So it teaches me. It teaches you. The grace of God is the spirit of God. That's what the grace of God is. That's who he is. He is the spirit of God that teaches me to deny all ungodliness, all worldly lusts. Oh, my Lord. And what else did it teach us? It teach me to live soberly. Soberly. Then it teaches me what? To live righteously. Huh? And then it teaches me what? To live godly. Huh? So it's, first of all, it teaches me to deny ungodliness, but to live godly. Deny unrighteousness, but to live righteous. To not be uh, this sporadic, unstable, immature child of God, but to be sober. Oh, my God. And then what it does? See, for the critics that think, look what Luke said. Luke said, I want you to do this. All the days of your life. And here comes Paul comes along and says, by way of the Spirit of God, he says, in this present world. In other words, where am I to live godly? Where am I to live righteous? Where am I to live soberly? Where am I to deny ungodliness? Where am I to deny all unrighteousness. That's right here on this earth. Christ is, or the church is Christ on earth. Walking to and fro, manifesting a sinless life. Manifesting a life that the world can look at and say, that's God right there. That's the man of God. That's a woman of God. They have no affection for the world, but they are walking free of the cares of this world. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Oh, bless you, Father. So, I'm being taught. Someone said, well, I don't have no teacher. No, 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 no. I'm being taught. Adam didn't have nobody there, but he was taught. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Oh, bless you, Jesus. The Holy Ghost is a teacher. Listen, let's go to one of my favorite passages, John 16. Let's go there, and let's look at verse 13 again. It says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. The Holy Ghost is not impotent. The Holy Ghost don't need my spin on nothing. The Holy Ghost is not limited to my intellect. The Holy Ghost is not handicapped and without the ability to communicate the intent and the express mind of God to any individual, whether they just got saved today or they've been saved a hundred years, the Holy Ghost is God in us, in every son. So he doesn't, he's not handicapped now. So, so when sin rises up, the Holy Ghost objects to it. You, when you're walking in your life, the moment you entertain a sinful thought, the Holy Ghost objects to that. And he objects to it before, because he knows your thoughts before, you, before they bring them to manifestation. And so he objects to that. 
He tells you you're not supposed to think like that. He tells you you're not supposed to respond like that. He tells you you're not supposed to talk like that. Sometimes in our conversations, my God, why, hey, my cosa, why are you talking? The Holy Ghost said, don't you say that. The Holy Ghost said, don't you think like that. The Holy Ghost said, don't you agree with that. The Holy Ghost is saying that, but you have a choice. You can push beyond the Holy Ghost. And you can do it anyway. I can do it anyway. See? But the but, but the expectations of God is that I choose, see, I choose to serve him. I choose to obey him. And it's only in my choosing to obey God will I be able to live a sinless life. That's the point that I really want you to grab. Only when I choose to obey God am I able to manifest and live a sinless life. No matter where I am, no matter where you are, the Bible is full of men and women being in adverse situations, but they still held true to God. There was some in exile, but they still held true to God. You can live a sinless life no matter where you are as long as you choose to obey God. Because God is the one that infuses you with the power. God is the one that stretches out in you and says, I'm here. God is the one that stretches out in you and says, I don't have any problem with sin. God is the one that says, I've already overcome sin. God is the one. So anytime I'm in him and he's in me and I'm in Christ and Christ is in me and I'm an heir of God and I'm a joint heir of Christ and my life is hid with Christ in God anytime Satan lose that war Satan lose that battle sin has no more power over that type of son Oh, bless you, Father. Now, I want to just, I want to give you a, a setup here. I need to finish this here, but I'm not going to finish it today. So I'm going to see if we can come back and finish this another time. But I want to set something up for you here. I want you to set up the, the, this fact that this didn't, this choice was always from the very beginning. And this choice that we have has been constant all the way through every dispensation and every situation that deals with man's relationship with God. So I want you to look at something that I remember preaching. I preached this um, about 40 years ago, a little over 40 years ago. And I, there was a big landmark in my life. That's the reason I remember this so vividly. And when I preached it, it was entitled, My Farewell Address. Now, I'm not going to tell you who I was preaching it to. <laughs> but I was preaching my farewell address. And this is the word that God gave me. It's in Joshua chapter um, 24. And I just want you to note it because this is the setup. I, I, I'm going to come back to my notes from this living a sinless life because I never got to Ephesians chapter 2 and dealt with that. I kind of like went beyond that and went on to 
Luke chapter 1. And uh, there is so much here. We didn't deal with Hebrews chapter 2 and uh, et cetera. And uh, we have many other passages of scriptures. John chapter 17, uh, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. But I want us to look at this word in Joshua chapter uh, 24. Let me just get it and I'm going to read it. Not going to have time to do anything with it because we're just getting ready to uh, exit and get into our uh, next ministry. But in Joshua chapter 24, and I'm going to start at verse 13. This is after they done come out of bondage. This is after God has delivered the children, the Hebrews, out of Egypt. So if you would make an analogy, it would be like this would be after God has set you and me free from the captivity of sin. And now you're getting instructions. And so this is what it says. Verse 13 says, and I have given you a land for which ye did not labor. Now, you know, we got salvation, but we didn't labor for salvation. That's why it says it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Then it says, and cities which ye built not. God says, I didn't even use you to build it. I know we think we build and stuff. But except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that builds it. Okay? So, so these, these are just principles that should govern our attitude and our approach, you know, inside of walking in the faith. And then he goes on and says, I, and, and ye dwell in them. In other words, you're living in the luxury of this. Isn't salvation a place that we live in when we didn't have nothing to do with creating it? My Lord, my Lord. He says, of the vineyards and olive gods which ye planted not, do you eat? Listen, let me say something. You know what that's telling us? No matter how smart you think you are, no matter how smart I think I am, that's not what feeds me. That's not sufficient to sustain me. He's saying you're eating the olive yards, eating of the vineyards, which you did not plant. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Now, let's look at this here a little bit more. Just a, just a tad. Now, therefore, verse 14, if it seem, notice what he says, if it's, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the God which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Verse 15, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. And it was the choice. God is telling them here, I done brought you out of bondage now. Because back there in bondage, you didn't have a choice. Back there in bondage, you had a slave master. I brought you out. You didn't even have to use a sword. You did not have to shoot one bow and arrow. I, by my mighty hand, brought you out. The Bible said, whom the Son set free is free indeed. I brought you out. I said, I brought you out. 
Now, now make a choice. Even though I brought you out, even though I delivered you, I am still giving you a choice, and I will respect your choice. I will honor your choice, because the only way I'm going to feel affection from you is that I know you freely choose to give your affection to me. I don't get no affection from having to force you. That's a Pharaoh tactic. That's an Egypt tactic. That's a Lucifer tactic. I am not Lucifer. I'm not Pharaoh. I want you to freely love me. And if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And if you keep my commandments, you will live a sinless life. God bless you. I'm going to stop right there. We could go much more in that. And I'm trusting that we get to, get to come back and do this again. There's so much in this. When Doc ministered this lesson, I, I just was really, really blessed. And, and I really want to uh, continue. There are so many other vital, vital principles that we need. It's not just knowledge. Guys, it's not just knowledge. Mike preached something that God used him to preach a long time ago. We've come to the end of knowledge, and we, we still haven't grabbed that for what it really means. We still haven't. I know that people would beg to differ with me, but I'm still going to tell you, you haven't grabbed that the way we, God said that. Because, see, just knowledge, you know, we, we get heaped up with knowledge, but what is the application of the knowledge? And now do we see that knowledge being rebounding, abounding back, through our everyday decisions and our everyday operations see, because we still, with all the knowledge we have, we still have to choose every day to take up our cross and follow him. We love you today. We bless God for you. Well, we're going to come back another time and pick up right there. And the next lesson is the choice is yours. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Well, I hope you've been blessed today with the word. I have been blessed just to be here to share with you and to just fellowship inside of the Spirit of God. You know, I, I, I get joy out of just communing with God through his word. And I want to encourage you today to go back through the lesson and let the Holy Spirit minister to you. Let me encourage you to support the work of the ministry and give your gifts at uh, the various uh, links that is on the screen right now. You can go to the cash app, that's dollar sign MB Global Church, and you can give your contribution there. You can also give from at the donor box at marybanks.net forward slash give. And uh, give your offering today. Let's, let's be a blessing. Let's be a blessing to what God is doing here uh, and, and reaching out around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, we are living in uh, perilous times. And the sons of God, God is bringing this church. When I say this church, not just talking about Spring, Texas, or Bible teachers. But God is bringing his church to the realization that the only thing you're going to have in this earth is each other. He's bringing his church to that realization. So you're precious, my friend. You're precious. You're a special person in the eyes of your brothers and sisters and in the precious eyes of God. Help the body in your giving. Let it be a worship unto God. Cash app, dollar sign, MB Global Church, as well as marybanks.net forward slash give. We love you today, and we trust that we've been a blessing to you. Until the next time, I'm Bishop Jerome Jones, and I'm saying to viewers here 
and around the world, if you go with God, I know that God will surely go with you. Have yourself now by all means a Jesus-filled day. Bye-bye.